Good evening and welcome to the San Bernardino City Council meeting on February the 11th, 2020. We'll call this meeting to order. Roll call, please. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Medina? Here. Councilmember Mason? Here. Vice Mayor Salazar? Here. Mayor Medina? Here. Uh, may I ask Mr. Tom Hamilton to lead us in the pledge this evening? Thank you, Tom. Public comments for items that are not on the agenda. Speaker cards have been turned into the city clerk and Melissa. John Barrelier. Mr. Barrelier. I'm going to talk about the safety of the center over here at the uh, intersection. City court council members should expect the best efforts from their city employees, police, firefighters, street workers, office personnel, and themselves. I expect the best of them too, because as an experienced school teacher, I know that expectations are often the difference between a C grade and the honor roll, between success and failure. After days of my pushing the point, more than 30, Several trucks and men were out in front putting down cones in front of the Senior Citizen Center, and I was elated that best efforts were forthcoming to secure the safety of the seniors at this dangerous intersection. This without time-wasting committees or consultants, leaders with foresight and cojones involved because there was, they recognized the immediacy of the situation. After a couple of hours, they left only painted intersections, already 10 years late, and then they left. I asked them as they were leaving, is that it, you're done? Yep. Happiness balloon deflated. What about the speed bumps, the flashing lights in the roadway, the three signs that were at the approaches to the center, never to be? shorted, cheaped out. I know it was the least expensive way to do it, but geez, these are your grandparents. Beyond that, seniors at the intersection deserve and have a legal right to the best and immediate safety at the intersection. This is not a political luxury to be bestowed. True safety is implemented before an accident, not afterward. A good start, thank you. Now finish the job. Will the reality of the thud of crippling impact of hard steel against soft old flesh be your legacy? Something that you could have prevented with mere money. When I was a teacher, I never used this term, but we're all adults here and it fits. This could be described as a half-assed effort towards safety. We have expectations of you. We have expectations of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Berler. Nancy Foreman. Hi, I'm Nancy Foreman. I live on, live on Poplar Avenue in San Bruno. I'm fairly new to attending council meetings, planning department, traffic and safety, and I want to share my observations about San Bruno. I hear a lot of what we can't do, we've never done it that way before, or that's not allowed. I would like to see our city adopt a we can approach, or at least a willingness to look at concerns with the new approach. In December, when Linda Mason was installed as council person, it was odd to me that she was installed at the end of the meeting. The council was down a voice and a vote. Because you've always done it this way does not make it the only way. Departments need to talk to each other. We all know there's a lot of proposed buildings in the pipeline, be it the TCP, YouTube, Google, school campuses, or new housing on school sites that were just recently sold. 
All departments and committees need to talk to each other. Maybe they can share costs of reports, evaluate the impact to the community. Each transaction affects the other in the entire city. San Bruno has already agreed to reduce one lane of traffic on Huntington Avenue southbound at San Bruno Avenue to accommodate a large housing unit that was not designated within the legal setback according to code. If we're not careful and consider an all over community plan, the city will end up in gridlock. Today you only need your eyes to tell you that there's a significant increase in traffic. When a member of the community writes a letter to the city, me included, we get no response or acknowledgement. Example, I wrote to the Planning Commission in September 2019 when a for sale sign went up on the house in back of me. I knew it was going to be a teardown. I asked to speak to the owners before they spent any money on plans, inviting them to visit our house to see elevation problems. Asked to work together for a win-win, hoping to save them money and time. No response till last week when I got a letter that they were requesting a variance for a monster build. April 2018, I wrote to Traffic and Safety Committee regarding a very difficult T intersection at Poplar and Santa Lucia. Then again in September 2019, I had no response. I finally went to Traffic and Safety Committee meeting only to be told my letter hadn't come to the top of the pile. Really, since April 2018? I know the school board and city councils are separate entities, I get that, yet one does affect the other. I please ask you to be proactive and not reactive. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Is there any other folks who wanted to speak on items not on the agenda? If not, we'll go ahead and move on to announcements and presentations, please. Good evening. The Senior Center will be hosting the annual Valentine's Day party on Friday, February 14th, 2020. Join us for roasted turkey lunch and entertainment by the Full House Band. Advanced tickets can be purchased at the Senior Center for a $6 suggest suggested donation for those 60 and over. The San Bruno Library will be presenting another installment in the Coffee and the Cosmos series on Saturday, February 29th at 4 p.m in the downstairs community room. The featured speaker will be Dr. Nick J. Scott, lead research scientist at NASA Ames Research Center in California's Silicon Valley. Please join us for a talk, some refreshments, and informal question and answer session. We are now accepting applications for various part-time positions for summer employment. Interviews will take place in April. You can pick up and return your application to the Recreation Center at the San Bruno City Park or visit calops.org. We are hiring for summer camp and aquatics programs. On February 21st, from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m., 6th, 7th, and 8th graders from San Bruno are invited to the teen dance held in the gym at the Recreation Center. Come and dance to your favorite songs. Pre-sale tickets will be sold at Parkside School and the Recreation Office for $10. Tickets can also be purchased at the door for $13. And finally, the father-daughter dance will be held on Saturday, February 22nd from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. here at the Senior Center. Tickets are available at the Recreation Center office. Enjoy dinner, dancing, and receive a commemorative photo with your daughter to remember the special night. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, very much. Next is item F, receive report and review status of local emergency related to repairs to Crestmore Canyon and continuing declaration of local emergency. Director Tan. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, Public Works Director uh, Jim Tan. The uh, objective of the presentation tonight is to provide you with a brief update on the Crestmore Canyon project. Since our last um, council meeting on January 28th, uh, we've made some additional progress uh, on the project. The contractor, Hillside Drilling, continued their drilling operations and installed the sealed uh, beams. Um, uh, all the drilling work uh, to install the steel beams were completed uh, on uh, January 31st. And on February 3rd and 4th, the contractor removed their drilling rig, rig uh, and off all the um, excavated materials off the site. So the construction of the wood lagging also began uh, during that time. And starting on the 5th of last week, um, the contractor began installation of the tiebacks. Um, they ran into some issues with the installation process, but was able to bring in new equipment. So as of yesterday, 
uh, two tiebacks um, were installed and additional tiebacks were installed uh, today as well. And staff from the geotech in engineering firm Cotton Showers and Associates have, has been on site um, daily to uh, inspect the project. Currently there are still traffic control measures in place and <coughs> sorry, at times there may be a need for <coughs> excuse me, inter intermittent stoppage of uh, traffic during construction activities. So residents uh, driving through the construction <coughs> Sorry, uh, residents driving through the construction area should use caution and drive slowly as there are large uh, construction equipment being used uh, for the work. So I have some few uh, pictures that I will show you of the, uh, the work activities. Uh, this picture shows all of the, um, the steel beams um, that were uh, installed, uh, completed again end of uh, January. Um, here's a picture of um, the crew, you know, the, what they had to do is they had to excavate, excavate down uh, to build a, a wall structure as well. Here's a picture of them, the crew con contractors installing the wood lagging. Um, and then you see the steel beam members there, the vertical members there um, on the picture as well. Here's the machine that they're actually using uh, to install the tie backs. Um, it's you know, quite an interesting machine. You know, it's, again, it's sitting on the, uh, the roadway on, on top of the sidewalk and they're, they're drilling um, backwards perpendicular towards San Bruno Avenue, towards Lenardi's. So, so the angle of entry for the, uh, the tie back is uh, 22 degrees. So there are 12 tie backs uh, as part of this project. There's another picture of the, uh, the machine that's being used for the tie back uh, installation. And there's another picture uh, that was taken today, uh, this morning of, of the operation. So we're hoping that the, uh, the whole construction activities will be done um, probably early March. And, um, and we'll can close out the project. Great, thank you. I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Any questions, Council? Thank you. We'll move on to consent calendar. All items on the consent calendar are considered routine or implement an earlier council action and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion unless requested. Any items that uh, need to be pulled by council under consent? Not anything that needs to be commented on or followed up. If not, I'll look for action. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and second to approve consent. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Five of a voice. And we'll move on to item six. Item 6A, hold a public hearing, waive first reading, and introduce an ordinance to amend and replace San Bruno Municipal Code Title 12, Land Use Article 3 Zoning, Chapter 12.100, Off-Street Parking and Loading, and amend Chapters 12.92, 12.96, and 12.200, and adopt the Associated Parking Design Standards Resolution and Parking Fee Resolution. Good Darcy evening, Smith. Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Darcy Smith, and I'm the City Community and Economic Development Director. And tonight, I'll be giving you a brief introduction to this item. This is a public hearing on the city's proposed new parking regulations, which consist of an ordinance that will amend the zoning article of the municipal code and the associated parking design standards resolution and parking fee resolution. So I'll be making this presentation along with the city's lead contractor on this effort, Kelly Beggs from Good City Company. Also in attendance tonight from the project team who can assist in answering any questions or clarifying any information presented is Pamela Wu, the city's planning and housing manager, and Jason Moody, the managing principal from economic and planning systems who provide the economic analysis. And additionally, given this long and lengthy effort involving many city departments, I just want to acknowledge the work from the public work staff, especially on the parking design standards resolution and the city attorney, Mark Zaffirano. The objective for this item tonight is to hold this public hearing and um, the staff's recommendation is to introduce the ordinance and adopt the associated resolutions. There's many objectives of this work, so I just wanted to highlight some of them now and you'll hear them interwoven throughout the presentation tonight. It started over a year ago when the city council asked the staff to examine the transit quarter parking standards and look at revising those. And that was followed up by a community town hall held here when we discussed parking and 
and brainstorm some new strategies around increasing off-street parking in residential neighborhoods to ease some of the parking pressures in those areas. The City Council also adopted the Downtown Parking Management Plan, which identified the long-term strategy of increasing parking supply in the downtown through a parking garage and funding that in part through the new parking in-lieu fees, which are presented tonight in the parking fee resolution for consideration. That's interrelated to the city's significant interest in downtown economic revitalization. And we really are, are optimistic and hopefully um, these regulations really pave the way for that to happen. The city's been undertaking other efforts to address parking, such as the recently adopted revised residential parking permit program. So I've touched on some of those key objectives, but I think you'll, you'll see clearly tonight just the breadth of this effort, why so much time was involved, why so many departments were involved, and um, the real purpose of it to both the residents of this community and the business community. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Kelly Beggs. She'll provide the background, an overview of the ordinance and resolution, summarize the city council study session that was held on January 28th, and any ma minor modifications that were made to the ordinance that you saw then and the resolution, and end with tonight's recommendation to the city council. Good evening, I'm Kelly Begg, senior planner with Good City Company, and I'm pleased to be here before you again um, to present the ordinance to council this evening. I will be repeating some information from my previous presentation to council on January 28th as I do recognize that there may be new members of the public in the audience this evening. So to start off with some background, this slide shows the timeline of how the ordinance update was initiated and how feedback from council, planning commission, and the public fed into the process. The ordinance update began, as Darcy said, with direction from city council to revise the proposed TCP parking standards and then continued with a public town hall meeting on parking issues in San Bruno from a resident's perspective. In December, planning commission recommended that council adopt the ordinance and resolution unanimously. And lastly, two weeks ago, council reviewed and provided feedback on the ordinance and resolution. Next, I'll provide a brief overview of the ordinance and the resolutions. I'll note that there are three separate documents for review. The first document is the ordinance, which contains zoning standards that regulate off-street parking and loading. Next, there's a parking design standards resolution, which includes traditional parking design standards and mechanical and automated parking design standards. And then lastly, there's a parking fee resolution, which outlines the fee amount for the in-lieu fee and the parking compliance permit. And some of this information has been separated into resolutions that facilitate updating standards that change more frequently due to technological and design innovation. So to start off with that first document, the ordinance. The ordinance applies to new construction, enlargements to existing buildings, and changes of land use in existing buildings. It will replace the existing parking chapter and amend other sections of the code to resolve conflicts between the proposed ordinance and existing municipal code. Some key features of the ordinance. The ordinance regulates the minimum vehicle parking and loading spaces, as well as parking spaces for motorcycles, scooters, and bicycle parking. Landscaping requirements for parking areas are set forth, and transportation demand management and parking management um, plan requirements are also included. This slide reviews the objectives of the ordinance. The proposed ordinance includes updated standards designed to be both resident and business friendly. It also includes regulations that aim to increase off-street parking for residential areas, facilitate economic revitalization in the downtown, and implement policies of the city's long-range planning documents. The next two slides provide examples of the updated parking standards for major land use categories. As you'll see, the organization has been streamlined to make the chapter more reader friendly. This slide shows the required citywide off-street parking for residential land uses, which have been revised to be consistent with council direction regarding more conservative TCP parking standards, and then also to be consistent with state density bonus law. 
This slide shows the required off-street parking for major non-residential land uses. As you can see, one category on the far left can cover multiple similar land uses. And then on the right side, the number of required parking spaces is shown and sets forth the number of spaces required per square foot of floor area. Non-residential land uses located in specific plan areas such as the TCP area can also reduce this um, required amount of parking by 10% with implementation of a TDM plan and a parking management plan. This slide outlines some strategies to increase supply of off-street parking in residential areas. Many older homes in San Bruno cannot fit a modern vehicle in existing garages and driveways, and these strategies aim to remedy the, those issues. Um, the bulleted strategies would allow property owners with non-conforming garages and driveway depths to bring one of those elements into conformance to fit a modern vehicle um, and to help alleviate that demand for on-street parking by moving more vehicles onto private properties. Now I'll move on to the economic revitalization objective. Um, these exemptions apply to uh, buildings in the central business district um, that are constructed prior to 2005 as the property owners in these buildings have paid into a parking assessment district, um, which existed from the late 1980s to the mid 2000s. And those, that parking assessment district funded the existing surface parking lots that you see downtown. Um, with this exemption, no additional off-street parking or in lieu fee would be required for the first 2,500 square foot um, of any change in use to a more intensive use. So for example, that would be something like a retail space to a gym, which has a higher parking requirement, um, or a retail space to a cafe. The provision is intended to encourage the establishment of small businesses in existing vacant and underutilized buildings downtown. Another policy that will facilitate economic revitalization is the parking in lieu fee. The fee would apply to non-residential land uses located in specific plan areas, um, and property owners could pay the, P, the, the fee on a per space basis um, in lieu of, of providing off-street parking for up to 30% of required parking spaces. This slide presents the recommended fee amounts for different specific plan areas. Staff recommends a sliding scale for specific plan areas not including the Bay Hill specific plan area. And the sliding scale is designed to facilitate the resolution of small parking deficits and then to disincentivize the resolution of larger parking deficits. A fee of $60,000 per space is feasible for the Bay Hill specific plan area, as you'll see on this slide, and that's due to higher land values um, and the elevated cost of constructing an underground parking garage, which is required for a variety of reasons in this area. I will point out that there is an additional fee on this slide, um, which is highlighted in the black box, and that's included for office land uses in specific plan areas, excluding the Bay Hill. The fee is a flat per space fee of $25,000 for office land uses. And after an additional analysis, staff has found that office uses can generate higher rents than other non-residential land uses and can support a higher fee than the sliding scale amounts originally proposed. The in lieu fee amount and the parking compliance permit fee is included in this parking fee resolution, which is attachment three to your staff report. And then on to the last objective, implementation of the city's long-range planning documents. Um, so this has also been a key goal of the ordinance update, especially as the city is required to implement certain housing element policies to maintain its housing element certification. In particular, I'll point out that the ordinance will implement important policies in the housing element, especially uh, housing element program 3H, and it does that by updating res residential parking standards pursuant to the state density bonus law requirements and allowing tandem parking. This ordinance implements poli other policies of the general plan, the TCP, and the housing element, and those are summarized in detail in attachment five to the staff report. The parking design standards resolution is one of the other resolution documents that you have, and that's a separate document um, from the ordinance. It includes design standards for parking spaces and lots, as well as mechanical and automated parking standards. Um, and mechanical and automated parking is an area of emerging technology that staff expects continual evolution and innovation in. 
Um, the resolution specifies operational performance standards for mechanical and automated parking that cover items like maintenance, inspection, and availability of vehicles to ensure that these structures are truly functional and long lasting. So next I'll summarize our January 28th, 2020 meeting. So some key study session topics that were discussed um, include the maximum amount of required off-street parking that can be provided in mechanical and automated parking facilities, tandem parking for customers of businesses, and the parking in lieu fee amounts. So in response to public comment urging council to consider higher maximums for off-street parking allowed in mechanical parking um, structures, council did ask staff to explain why there were limits imposed on how many of the required off-street parking spaces can be accommodated in these facilities. And staff responded that some drivers will be reluctant or unable to use mechanical parking facilities due to the delay associated in vehicle access, the novelty of tech the technology, and then also the physical inability to fit a larger SUV within some of these structures. However, if LA assistance is provided, the issues with the delay and the new technology would be alleviated. So staff has revised the limit to a maximum of 75% if valet assistance is provided. If no valet assistance is provided, the limit would be 50%, which is no change from the previous version of this document. Council also urged staff to consider the recommendation of Planning Commission to allow tandem parking for customers of businesses with valet assistance. And similar to mechanical parking, tandem configurations for custom parking for customer parking could be functional if there is valet assistance provided. So the ordinance now does allow that if valet assistance is provided. And then lastly, in response to public comment about the difference in fee amounts between Bay Hill and other specific plan areas for the parking in Luffy, um, there was a discussion at the last meeting and staff did respond that the higher land values in the Bay Hill area can support the higher in Luffy. Um, staff is proposing no change to the Bay Hill fee, but as we discussed earlier, there is one additional fee for office land uses in other specific plan areas that are not the Bay Hill. So other final revisions of notes um, include the addition of vehicle and bicycle parking standards for emergency shelters, and that change was made to provide um, additional consist consistency with state law, and then the additional in lieu fee of $25,000 for office land uses. I'll move on to tonight's action. In conclusion, City Council is requested to take action tonight to hold the public hearing, waive the first reading, and introduce an ordinance to amend and replace San Bruno Municipal Code Title 12, Article 3, Chapter 12.100, and amend Chapters 12.92, 12.96, and 12.200, and adopt the Associated Parking Design Standards Resolution and Parking Fee Resolution. This concludes my presentation. I'm available to answer any questions that you may have as our other consultants st and staff. Thank you, Kelly. Why, Kelly, it's at the mic. Are there any questions for her? Why she's at the mic? No one? Okay, um, thank you. We'll call you up if something comes up. Um, this is a public hearing, so are there any speaker cards? Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak? It is a public hearing. Once we close the public hearing, then it will preclude you from speaking further uh, on the topic when it comes back to council. Um, I have no speaker cards, but if you are wishing to speak, if you could follow behind Robert. I didn't fill out a card. Robert Recall, 7th Avenue. At one of the previous meetings, a question came up on how do you figure the s square footage of a uh, business? Because all of the business square footage is not necessarily uh, used by the customers or so I don't know if that has been really addressed. It, it talks about fees per square foot, but it doesn't uh, cover that. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, Mr. Hamilton. Hi, uh, Tom Hamilton, uh, Crestmore Drive. Um, uh, I'm on the Planning Commission. We uh, sent this to you, 5-0. Um, one, uh, I've been thinking about this more since it left the Planning Commission and after the last, uh, the last meeting here when we talked about it regarding the in-lieu fees. Um, at the Planning Commission, I commented, you know, on a desire to keep those fees as low as possible. 
um, thinking, you know, about the economic uh, vitalization, um, revitalization plans for downtown. And, but in thinking about it more, with the 2,500 square foot exemption that's already in place in the ordinance for the, uh, the majority of businesses downtown, there are, most businesses are 100% covered and would never need to use, would never need to purchase, you know, any or use the in lieu fee. So um, it might be prudent to maybe even raise it, um, just to you know, you know, in, encourage, um, you know, businesses or, or to, um, you know, provide parking because you know parking is needed. I've just moved a little bit on that on that uh, on that topic, so I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Next one. Please. Marcia Sorry. Glassner on Linden Avenue. I, I really just kind of have a question. Um, when we're talking about the valet, um, the valet assistance for the mechanical parking, whether that would be required to be free or whether there would be a charge for that, because it just seems like that would definitely, you know, affect the, the acceptability of that to, um, to the people who, who need to park. That's all. Thank you. Anyone else? Max? Hi, everyone. My name is Max Wayne, and I am the owner of Atlas Pizza Parlor. And uh, yes, back to Robert's question, actually, I'm going to reemphasize on the square footage, because uh, I have a very unique situation, because I uh, have 6,600 square feet of space, which is I'm only using maybe one third, not even one third. And when we increase the usage for the customers, 2,500 square feet, I still don't even fall into the category. Maybe I don't know. I'm I'm not sure the technicality of these uh, these uh, uh, amendments, but I would like to get more clarification on how much square footage we can use for the customer use and how much we can we get exempt on. Um, on the uh, the space we use for storage, or or the um, or the employees' use, uh, or the kitchen or the other side. So that I would like to get a clarification on that. If how much space can we get for the customer use? So f my example again, 6,600 square feet. I don't know what how where I'm going to fall in. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else? If not, um, can I have a motion to close public hearing? To the chair, uh, would, would it be possible to leave the public hearing open until we get response from staff in case that spurs any other questions from the audience? I mean, there were some questions that were posed. I, I, I do have these down. I do have, I'm going to ask right. staff to respond. But well, I, I would prefer to have staff respond before we close the public hearing. Okay. If that's okay. We'll do it at this time. It wasn't, a, a folks, your questions were very succinct and to the point. So I think we can accommodate that, but I don't want to, where we're going to have people continue to come up and back and forth just so we can um, start to tackle those. One thing I think that has come up, and I, it was addressed last time, but... No. Microphone. One thing that did come up, uh, which was addressed last time, but just for clarification, and that is on the square foot footage of the business, and I think that just sometimes gets a little confusing, and it's been a, you know, it's been a little bit of time. So if we could just re-clarify that, please. Sure. I'll... I'll try to answer that, Darcy Smith, Community and Economic Development Director. The definitions for this particular ordinance are contained within the ordinance. You don't have to flip around to a different section of the municipal code, and they're quite detailed, many pages of it. And there's the floor area definition for non-restaurant uses, I'll answer that question next, um, is basically measured to the outside walls. If you had shared spaces, you'd measure kind of the inside walls. If you had multiple tenant spaces within a larger building, for example. Um, and for those, we do include the storage areas and, and habitable spaces. But for example, like attics and basements would be excluded. For restaurants, this issue has come up of how do you count the space? We're a little different. Sometimes we have a lot of storage. Sometimes we have space we really don't use. It doesn't add more customers. It doesn't add more employees. So most cities, and we're following that that sort of general um, that general trend, define restaurant square footage a little bit separately when they calculate the parking requirement. And we only count the area um, that is for public um, public space, and we exclude the storage areas. So that's a special definition. And we've just found that's more um, more accurate 
way to kind of estimate the, the parking demand associated for the customers. So there was also a question about valet assistance. So our ordinance and the associated resolutions don't specify whether a fee could be charged, but I think generally these are, when there is valet, it's usually offered to um, the employees. So for example, in our conversations with YouTube, they've said it would be only for the, the employees only, and so they wouldn't charge a fee just because it's, they're trying to facilitate their employees using it. Um, and I think it would just be atypical to charge a fee. It's not a typical valet system where you're pulling up to a restaurant and someone's parking your car for you. It's something that the property owner or the tenant is doing to try to facilitate making sure they have the parking and you're using it, if that makes sense. Um, there's also the comment about the fees, and I think you saw tonight, we did take another example at just the office use, which commands higher rents, higher property values of a office building, and so we have a, a new fee for you to consider tonight for the office uses. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for entertaining my uh, sure. my uh, request. And so if there, <coughs> since I don't see anybody else standing up, then I will make a motion to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Motion made and second to close the public hearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Five on voice. Okay, we'll bring it back to council for Questions, comments, et cetera. Laura. Uh, I just have a follow-up question, um, Darcy, on the measurement again. So for, I get it for non-businesses, it's the out, for non-restaurants, it's the outside walls, but for restaurants, you said it's public space. That include the kitchen area, bathrooms, seating area, it's anything that. No, so I'll read the definition. Public floor area, pub floor area open and accessible to customers of the business, utility rooms, storage areas, restrooms, kitchens, and back of house operation areas are not included in public floor area. Okay. And that's mm -hmm. only for restaurants because of their special layouts. And then my other question is um, 2,500 square feet, just kind of get an idea. Is there a, are a lot of the small businesses on Sandwich Avenue within that 2,500 square feet? That's our best yeah. estimate. So if you can imagine maybe 25 feet by 100 feet in depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was what we were trying to capture with that exemption. And any thoughts on uh, commissioner's comments about raising those fees for? Well, I would say this is, these are brand new fees. So let's see how they are, um, how they are received. We haven't had anyone running down to City Hall. I can't wait to pay those, but that's sometimes how new fees go. But I would say um, we should check in after we get the first few payments and see how is how is that um, um, how is that playing out. So I think generally, you know, we do look at at development impact fees every few years, um, and we look at our we're doing our master fee study update. So this is something that staff would have on the radar to reconsider in a few years. And then just a clarifying question on, uh, um, we've, I've seen and I've heard and I've talked to, but I've never really been on site in a location where there's mechanical spaces. And I know if you go on the East Coast, they've been around for many, many, many years. In fact, I think 20 years ago, I was looking at mechanical lifts. And so it's a, it's a normal thing for them. I would assume just like anything, it's just a matter of getting used to it. and. You know, you'll see these mechanical spaces in, in parking garages and it'll become just a norm and it doesn't require any sort of uh, support or direction. You basically, you get a key, you unlock it, your key unlocks a certain level that comes up, drops down, whatever, so you can either pull in, park out, or you get, I don't know, a remote, how that works. But I would say it's pretty simple that, that people get it, whether it's, I mean, if you're living in a building and, it's a, and you're residential, you're going to get it and you're going to understand it because you're doing it every day. But to have them in spaces where it's public parking, um, well, I don't see that. Yeah, so you're, you're right that this is an emerging area and in, um, you have approved projects with it. Nothing has been built yet, but 111 San Bernardino Avenue would be the first that we anticipate to be built in. And it is proposed as part of the YouTube Phase 1 project and we're seeing increasing interest in it. We had a meeting le last week with a developer who really said this is really gonna make a big difference in me being able to build this project or not build it. Um, and that's what we're hearing, especially given issues with the water table and in San Bruno, which is really high, um, and the prohibition on above ground parking garages in many areas of town. 
That said, it is more commonly accepted by a repetitive user, such as a home homeowner or um, an apartment resident or a repetitive office employee. Um, you mentioned public. It would not be it would, common in a public scenario. Although there are cities in California, such as West Hollywood, with, which built an entire municipal parking garage that's fully automated. That's a little different. You kind of pull in, you're actually on like a turntable that then it's, you know, it's really futuristic. It sucks your car in and parks it for you, and then you, pass, you, you retrieve it on your phone and it reappears. Um, but mechanical parking, the simplest, just an up-down lift is sort of the more entry point that we're seeing initially here. And that with the valet assistance, especially for the car that comes in and is actually moved up, is, is an easier entry point. But it would not be really the public or customer or guest parking um, that would be the, sort of the initial entry. It would be more the repetitive users. Perfect. Thank you for the clarification. Any questions or comments from council? Yeah, I, I just want to unravel this a little bit, if you can help me um, to unravel this a little bit more. So the $60,000 fee is going to be for the Bay Hill specific plan office space. And in the staff report, it says, as after further consideration and more detailed analysis, staff recommends revising the in-lieu fee for office land use in all specific plan areas except Bay Hill. So when I looked at the Bay Hill specific plan, I, I just noticed the Bay Hill specific plan. So I'm trying to figure out if you take out Bay Hill, what are we looking at that's paying $25,000? So uh, areas within the transit corridors plan, so not just downtown, areas within the transit corridors plan. So areas along El Camino Real, areas along San Bruno Ave, close to Barton Caltrain, where you really could have an office development that may be looking at uh, either above ground or subterranean parking. Okay. Um, when we looked at it again, office can really, um, there's the value there to um, obtain additional in lieu fee payments. Uh, whereas we were really uh, looking at the in lieu payments to be something to incentivize uh, more revitalization along downtown and some of those businesses that really have a hard challenge expanding because they cannot provide the parking. Uh, the other thing that I, I think is important to note uh, that we talked about last time is both the in lieu fee and mechanical parking is completely discretionary. It is not because it is allowed in a code that a building will uh, come in and be able to do it. Um, or business, and so they will apply, uh, and depending on the approval body, it may be staff, it may be the planning commission, or it may be the city council, depending on uh, what their project requests. And so we will take a look at all of the issues that we've talked about. Who are the users? Uh, is it appropriate? Is there uh, parking uh, generally available in the area? Or are for their unique use, um, their requests to fee out it's just going to create too much of a parking issue there. And, and so we will absolutely look at that and evaluate that with each request. Okay. Um, and then as far, so, that, so, just to, so just to be clear then, that's um, El Camino, that's all of downtown. Um, and is there a reason that that amount is more than half the amount of the Bay Hill? Yeah. Uh, so in Bay Hill, you cannot do above ground parking. You have to do subterranean parking. So subterranean parking is uh, quite a bit more, sometimes oftentimes double what it would cost. You know, it, it wouldn't be surprising to see figures upwards of 80 to 100 to 120,000 per space to build a subterranean parking space. And so in building the in lieu fee, um, you, you want to have the fee uh, at a level where um, it is um, enticing to use, but not um, uh, so low that there's overuse of the in lieu fee. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it is higher in Bay Hill because uh, the criteria around Bay Hill where you have to do subterranean parking and the economic development prowess of Bay Hill uh, sort of mandates that you can charge a larger in lieu fee than some of your other areas. Uh, and in the TCP, transit corridors area, uh, you can do above ground parking, and so typically it would be less. Okay. So then if you have a business and you're at the $25,000 amount and you said that will depend whether it's approved by staff or by the council, would now be the time that council says anything over 5,000 square feet would now be the time to make those restrictions? 
I think what you're saying is um, if the council wanted to place a requirement that any space over 5,000 square feet to have an in lieu fee would have to come back to the city council. Is that what you're saying? Or? Well, I'm, I'm asking where the where the boundaries are. So at what point does staff make the determination and at what point does city council make the determination? Fair. Um, so typically uh, these are wrapped into other entitlement applications for so a brand new building that is not asking for uh, any zoning change or variance change the decision making body would be the planning commission if uh, wrapped into those approvals they are asking for a discretionary action of the city council when that package comes up to you it would be uh, you're making a decision on the entire development so the Luffy and that discretionary action um, there are times where it can be uh, a staff level decision but it's it's going to be rare far few and in between most of these actions we're talking about really are going to require a planning commission or the city council okay, thank you um, for the valet services agreement do those agreements come to the city council those again are wrapped in with the other project approval so it would largely be planning commission or city council okay um, and then for the small business I just again unraveling it as it would help to have just an example so if you're a, if you're opening a restaurant and the restaurant is 2,500 square feet what are the requirements off the top starting to starting today Sure. So basically what this would allow is if you're changing the use of your restaurant um, and say it was previously a retail establishment and it's under, it's at or under 2,500 square feet, you would not be required to provide additional parking or to pay the in lieu fee. Now what if you're an existing restaurant and you're expanding? If you're expanding, you would be required to pay the in lieu fee or provide the parking on site, that is kind of a, a challenging thing for many downtown business owners to do. So is that, then is the purpose to incentivize new owners to come in? I just want to make sure we're not penalizing those who have already invested in the community. No, I mean, the, it would equally apply to mm -hmm, yeah. uh, a new owner or a um, or an existing owner uh, because what we're really talking about is the use okay uh, and so you can have an owner that uh, operated one building and now they want to change their use it's not dependent on the owner okay okay that's it for right now thank you Michael. Yeah. And just to uh, kind of follow up on Linda's comment um, it, it seems to me that it wouldn't the, the in lieu fee wouldn't be a penalty if anything it would be an opportunity for businesses that have no more space to add parking to actually um, have a mechanism to expand their business um, and as long as it, the numbers pan out they would have an opportunity to grow and pay the in lieu fee and rather than having to scrounge around and find parking and I know that's been an issue with a lot of the businesses that have come through so I, my only comment is that um, I think it's exciting that we, we have this in front of us tonight. It's been a long time coming and looking at that timeline, how long this has been drawn out and the amount of interaction we've had, the input from the public um, and all the work that staff has put into this. Um, I, I don't think I've in, in my years on council seen anything as comprehensive um, as, as this proposal. Uh, it addresses so many issues. It, it really tackles a lot of the things that we've been talking about for a lot of years. So I think it's really exciting that we're at this point where we can make these changes, update our municipal code, and um, start addressing something that's been um, a, a big issue for the community for a long, long time. So um, looking forward to approving this tonight. Marty. Thank you. So I'm looking at it a little different. Um, Downtown's parking is, is difficult currently today. With the amount of vacancies that we have right now, if they were filled and they were busy, it would be almost impossible to come in, get a parking spot when you wanted to, and enjoy our downtown. So we have a downtown parking plan, and that has um, key elements. It, are to put in parking meters and to build a parking garage. Okay, how are we gonna pay for it? To me, when I look at what other cities are, are charging, um, 
$2,500 is, is a great incentive, but it's not accomplishing what we need to do. We need funds to build a parking garage. Um, Millbrae has a $14,000 in lieu fee that was revised in 2015. San Carlos is raising their parking in lieu fee to 25,000 from 18,000 from a few years ago. Redwood City's at 25,000, started in 2015. Burlingame's at 54,000. Um, so I definitely appreciate the concept that we are gonna try to incentivize our downtown to flourish by, by, by making this parking uh, a, a transition of businesses easier financially. Yet the majority of our businesses currently downtown, they're gonna be okay with just the 2,500 square foot exemption. So I don't know if it's exactly needed, but um, my view on it, it it's, 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 it's on the low side. Um, I'm in favor of everything else. Um, I'm, in, I'm ready to vote for everything else. I don't know if it's so important to vote today on the in lieu fees. Um, and I'm, I guess my first question is to staff is, is, is there a rush to approve this resolution? And can we approve everything else and going forward? Would that cause any problems? City Manager. Uh, so you're right. Uh, this has sort of been a long time coming. Um, and uh, it is comprehensive. It, it does address a number of factors. Uh, so getting at the first one, is it urgent to address tonight? Um, no, we do, we, we do not have anyone that with a pending application that, I, uh, that will be impacted if there is, if there is a delay on this item. Uh, we did have the pl public hearing two weeks ago, uh, and at the end, of, at the close of that public hearing, uh, there was uh, generally, in general, uh, significant, if not unanimous, uh, uh, support to bring this back as fast as possible. And so staff did absolutely uh, uh, do that to accomplish uh, the mission of council, which is to, uh, this is long overdue and to bring it back. Uh, what I will say about um, the, the fees, I think you are, um, absolutely right in character uh, in your characterization that uh, most businesses uh, will be covered by the um, 25,000 um, uh, 2,500 square feet foot exemption um, uh, there are um, uh, new developments that there's one new development along San Bruno Avenue and there may be a few others that um, uh, have been uh, changed recently uh, that or, or may want to expand beyond 2,500 feet. And uh, that expansion may be beneficial economically um, for uh, San Bruno Avenue, uh, and they may not uh, meet the parking requirements. And, and so that's why we wanted to have reduced fees uh, specifically uh, geared towards downtown. Uh, and in the revision, um, when we looked at these between this meeting and the last meeting, we thought really hard about office. You could have an office development um, on San Bruno Avenue, but more importantly, within the transit corridors plan. And we did think that having uh, the reduced fees would be leaving money on the table, uh, so to speak, um, should they apply for uh, an in lieu fee. And so that is why those, uh, that area for office and the transit corridors plan has been raised to 25,000, um, which is roughly around, I mean, there was one city, I think it was San Carlos that recently up their fee to around twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars. I think that's sort of um, um, about right uh, for office. Uh, the other uses you're primarily going to see downtown, um, and you're absolutely right. In lieu fees are going to help uh, to put money in uh, in a fund to help fund a parking garage. Uh, that would be extremely helpful. Um, the other thing that we are looking at is parking meters uh, to help with demand management, both on street and off street. Uh, what our downtown parking management study revealed is that you'll drive down the street at some times uh, and there will not be a park available. But if you turn the corner, there's tons of parking available in our lots. And so uh, it is currently true uh, uh, right now that uh, during many parts of the day, every parking space on the street will be full or nearly full. 
uh, and we are not pushing people into those lots where there is free parking. And so that is one of the things that we uh, hope to do with uh, looking at paid parking is to um, look at having paid parking on street and potentially off street. And if you have it in both, have a higher on street rate and a lower off street rate with signage. And we've talked about that through the uh, plan to really push people to those lots. And so uh, I do think the city council, uh, if you're willing, could act on these. Uh, and then we could see how, how it goes and come back and increase them at, at a later date. Uh, but I, I, I do think that there are, are businesses um, uh, that have been thinking about expanding. Uh, maybe they haven't walked through the door, but they've been thinking about expanding. Uh, and uh, what I sort of have heard from Darcy over the last year is people sort of come in and ask the question, and they've sort of been told, no, you can't for a long time. We don't have a pending application. Uh, but I do th know that there are businesses that are looking forward to this. I have a, just a follow-up to that one. Go ahead. Might I have just uh, um, really quickly. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just want a point of clarification. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just a point of clarification to city manager's comment. The, the cost isn't being placed on the small business owner. It's being placed on the property owner? Is that Because it says here um, property owner on page 7 of 10, and I just want to make sure that the public is clear Fair. that it, I'm clear. <laughs> sure. You. I think the best way to say it is that it is placed on the applicant. And that could be the property owner, that could be the business operator, they could be one and the same, or they could have a financial arrangement that is different. Um, we, we really don't know, but the cost is, is on the applicant. Okay. Thank you. Marty. I have another question to staff regarding the cal or the determination of 100 100 square feet for a restaurant for a parking space. So that probably comes out of some book somewhere. But my, my, my question is, and I think um, restaurants are changing. You know, with, with, the, with the delivery of food, maybe you don't need as much space to have the restaurants that are currently happening because I know the restaurants I go to, there's a lot of takeout. And so maybe you don't need that 100 space anymore. Maybe you need 75. And, and, and when was that 100 square foot space last determined? You know, is it 10 years old data or, or, or what? But um, I was just curious about that. Um, and, and another question that I have is, you know, for the downtown, there's only so many spaces now. And it's going to take a while to build a garage. So how many, is there a limit on how many, I know there's a limit on the amount, 30% that you could use in, in lieu fee, which is discretionary approval, right? Mm -hmm. Is there a limit on the number of spaces? Because no, the, you're correct that the limit is a percentage of right. the required off street parking, but it is a discretionary approval. Right. Because one big restaurant could come in and say, okay, we're gonna take 30% and that's, that 30% is 30 spaces. Mm -hmm. Well, 30 spaces at our peak hour will make it very difficult for the other restaurants, the other businesses to have those spaces because at some point, as the city manager said, we're, we're at 85, 90 plus percent um, in parts of the different lots. Some lots are not as well known, and I'm not going to tell you where those are because that's why I park. <laughs> um, but honestly, it's uh, generally the bigger parking lots are behind uh, Newell's for some reason. Um, so anyhow, if staff could give a, give a little bit of, of a response on that, and, and don't get me wrong, I think what we're doing is long overdue, um, just that there's consequences to actions, and, and I'm more into this um, that we need to pay as we go, and, and we need money to build the parking structure. We need money to put in the meters, and it's a little difficult right now with our revenues. So. City Manager. Sure. Um, uh, so beginning with the last question and, the, and then backing up. Uh, I think you're, um, you're absolutely right uh, in saying that um, there are times where um, we – I'm actually blanking on what the question is. I'm sorry. <laughs> need, need, need meters. How, how a big 30 yes, – 30 the, the, the 30 percent. Could, could um, take – the excess of way we're right we're stuck. so you, yes that is the exact reason why the in lieu is not a fait accompli and so it is completely discretionary 
So if we do get someone that buys up a number of parcels and comes in to say, hey, I'm doing this massive development and I want to apply for a 30% waiver, that's where the staff analysis will come in and say, wait, 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 we think that's going to be too impactful on the AV or too impactful on El Camino Real. And that project may request it, uh, but when they go to the Planning Commission, they may not have staff support. And, and we would raise that issue. And so you're, you're absolutely right there. Um, and, and there's no cap, um, also in part because it's based on a percentage because we really don't know what's going to come in. We really don't know, you know what business is going to uh, apply for X number of square feet. I think the other point uh, or the other question about a hundred square feet, uh, where that comes from, I'm going to have one of the planners because my planning degree has never been used. You're correct. <laughs> that those are from engineering manuals that estimate parking demand based on square footage. And I think I agree with what you're saying, and that's why we've tried to estimate it based on public floor area because the makeup of these spaces really varies by the restaurant and we don't want to penalize people who have a larger kitchen that's not going to have that much demand it's the public floor area that's really generating the demand for the parking well said and the other part is all of these are living breathing documents and so uh, we will come back and we can we can revise them at a later date based on data based on how they're being used okay this, this will be my last question so if I'm looking at this chart and, and if you needed um, if you needed 11 spaces, mm -hmm. it would automatically go at 11 time, times 10,000. You yes. wouldn't get the first spaces at five spaces no. at 25 and then no. the, the next. If you have more than 10 spaces, the $10,000 amount applies to all spaces. Okay. And I'll add that getting to your point about not regulating, not capping the pure number of spaces, it's a percentage, but the sliding scale is designed to disincentivize resolution of that large parking deficit. Okay. Um, and I wasn't being totally honest because I have one more question. Um, <laughs> the, um, so, I don't know if I read it in, on our staff, there's a CPI uh, increase that goes with this uh, ordinance and resolution tonight yes. with these fees that, that it's going to be automatically increased? No, it's going to come back in a year, and we're going to kind of talk about it? The any CPI still requires council action okay. by resolution. But you, this wouldn't come back to you before July 1st, 2021. And then it would also give us an opportunity probably to give you an update on the fees and report back. Um, and I think a lot of cities set these, and then they don't, they don't, they don't, adjust them. That's what I've seen. And so we just wanted to put in the resolution, the staff report, that we would be raising them with the CPI. Or we would propose to raise them with the CPI and then yeah. present that to you. Just because some cities, then they fall so far behind and then 10 years later they're thinking, oh wow, it's still $25,000. What were we doing? And we would intend to bring this back annually when we bring back the master fee schedule uh, and uh, as we're looking at all of our fees together. I was just going to comment again that I, I appreciate Darcy's comment earlier where I think it is a let's look at this, let's move forward with this, let's come back with more data and then really reassess because I think right now we're, I, I, I prefer to go with staff's recommendations or staffing consultant. Any other questions or comments from council? Yeah, wh Linda. when would this be effective if approved tonight? So if the ordinance is introduced tonight, it comes back to the next meeting for adoption, and then it goes into effect 30 days after that. The parking design standards resolution would be effective immediately. The fees go into effect 60 days after adoption. So there is some value in acting tonight just on the fee resolution in fact, because it's 60 days later, and you could within the next you know, 60 days have someone want to come in and, and start the conversation about paying it. And I will say one thing, developers do like certainty. They like to know what the fees are when they call us and we can't necessarily calculate the fee easily. Um, it's a challenge to those developers and it really puts the city um, in a tough position we, because we can't calculate it. So we provide that clarity um, through adoption. Right, thanks. And just a comment, I remember speaking with uh, Darcy when I was on the Planning Commission and this is one of the reasons that applications have been denied for downtown. So uh, I agree, I echo that this has been a long time waiting. And I also want to thank staff for including, for not just having six public meetings, but including them 
in the agenda so that the public can see how many opportunities they've had to comment. And I also appreciate that you've included the staff responses to the questions that were raised at the last meeting so it becomes part of the public record. Thank you for doing that. Okay. Oh, gotcha. Uh, sorry. Okay. Um, a lot of the, what I've uh, felt and Linda capitalized on a lot of it and um, a few others have you had, but but at the same time, too, there was a lot of work that went in, and I appreciate that. And um, taking a page out of Mr. Hamilton, who I watched that planning commission as he was excited to see um, this, this come forward and uh, get approval from the planning commission. Um, but this is something that I think we do need to move uh, forward on. I mean, it's the same thing that we had talked about impact fees. Uh, when a former council member, Mr. Ibera, was here, and uh, at times things need to move forward. It is a, a breathing, living document. Uh, I think that it should come back at the master uh, uh, fee schedule, which is done annually, and that's how we ought to do it so that it doesn't come back and get gets slipped somewhere, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, God, we haven't seen that in five years. So. Uh, with that said, if there's nothing else from Council, there is some actions. Uh, first, we need to uh, have a motion and a second to waive the first reading. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> By the voice. Uh, we also now need to introduce the ordinance. I make a motion that we introduce the ordinance amending San Bruno Municipal Code Title 12, Article 3, Chapter 12.100, and amend Chapters 12.92, 12.96, and 12.200. Thank you second. for reading that. There's a motion made a second. Roll call. Councilmember Davis? Aye. Councilmember Mason? Aye. Councilmember Medina? Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Motion carries. And I believe is is there still one more? Two, There's two more. two more. So we have to also uh, adopt the Associated Parking Design Standards, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I Marty, just wanted. Sorry. To, I wanted to uh, to introduce the resolutions, and, but I also wanted to make a comment that so the developers that are out there, you better hurry up because these fees are going <laughs> to go up, um, and things are going to get tighter here. So let's get those applications in, and uh, I'd like to um, in, uh, introduce the resol resolution. Make a motion. Make to Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, and th th we were going to take these one at a time, I imagine. So yes. Right. Yes. One, I mean, a, this is for the parking design standards. Resolution? Yes. Thank you. Second on that. Okay. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Mason? Aye. Council Member Medina? Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar? Aye. Mayor Medina? Aye. Motion carries. One more. Now for the parking fee resolution. Is there a motion? A motion. Mo second. <laughs> a motion made and second. Roll call, please. Council Member Aye. Davis? Council Member Mason? Aye. Council Member Medina? Aye. Vice Mayor Salazar? Aye. And Mayor Medina? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Doll. Uh, now we'll move on to conduct of business, please. Item 7A, receive report on Rule 20A, Underground Utility District, and provide direction to staff. Thank you. Um, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, Jimmy Tan, Public Works Director, the presentation tonight is on Rule 28, Underground uh, Utility District. The uh, objective of the presentation is to provide the City Council with a brief background and an update on Rule 28, uh, discuss the recent events, and request the City Council to provide direction to staff regarding whether or not to establish a Rule 28 Underground Utility District. The agenda uh, is as follows. I'll provide some information on the background of Rule 28. Then I'll answer questions that you're probably thinking of. Um, why are we discussing Rule 20A? Um, and also the council, uh, to show the council various Rule 20A projects that the city has completed. Next, I'll briefly go over the Rule 20A requirements, um, then provide the proposed underground district locations, and talk about the current Rule 20A status in terms of our um, available work credits, then some options uh, the council uh, could, could uh, consider. And lastly, discuss the staff's recommendation and the next steps. So since 1967, uh, conversion of overhead electrical utilities to underground in California is performed under California Public Utilities Commission, Rule 20. 
Uh, there are three different parts, parts A, B, and C. Uh, part A is funded by uh, PG&E. Parts B and C are funded through entities other than PG&E ratepayers, such as uh, governmental agencies uh, or private entities through establishment of maintenance districts. Uh, the way it works is that PG&E allocates Rule 28 work credits to communities to finance the conversion of overhead to underground infrastructure. The work credits are to be used for undergrounding of local distribution lines, which are delivered, which delivers uh, electricity to neighborhoods and are generally supported by you know, wooden poles, um, and not these uh, high voltage uh, transmission lines. The work credits are distributed in proportion to the number of customers accounts, and San Bruno gets approximately about $150,000 uh, per year. So what is the purpose of undergrounding the utilities? Um, one is to improve the aesthetics. Uh, being that the overhead utilities contain nu numerous wires uh, for electric, telephone, and fiber is very unsightly. The other is to remove the exposure of the utilities uh, to the uncertainty of uh, weather, uh, you know, high winds and rain events or vehicle collisions. Uh, during high wind uh, events, the overhead utilities can you know, detach uh, from a fallen tree, creating uh, public safety issues. So by undergrounding the utilities, uh, it increases the uh, service reliability and uh, public safety. So the city of San Bruno has an ordinance in our municipal code, uh, section 8.28, you know, authorizing the city council to designate areas where overhead utilities exist and to form an undergrounding district. But the first thing the city must do is to identify a project that's in the uh, interest uh, of the public and pass a resolution forming an underground district. Then the accrued Rule 28 work credits can be used to pay for the costs related to the undergrounding. So if the existing fund is inadequate, uh, the city may borrow for the future work credits from pg e for a maximum of uh, five years. So why are we discussing Rule 28 now? Well, recently, uh, California Public Utilities Commission passed a resolution, E-491, uh, which will take away or transfer Rule 28 work credits from inactive cities to, um, and transfer it to the city of Live Oak, which is near Yuba City. Many agencies are affected by this passage of the resolution, and San Bruno is one of those communities. So a total of approximately $554,000 of unused work credits will be transferred from communities that haven't participated in the Rule 28 program over the past eight years uh, to the city of Live Oak. So for San Bruno, it's estimated that about $29,272 will be transferred to that city. So in order to avoid any transfer of uh, work uh, credits, uh, agencies have until March 11th um, this year to become active. And in order to do so, the city must satisfy the, uh, the following. Uh, formally adopt an undergrounding district, uh, start or complete uh, construction of an undergrounding conversion project within the last eight years from 2011 on, or, or receive Route 28 allocation from pg e for only five years or fewer uh, due to recent incorporation. So unfortunately, you know, we don't qualify for any of these items, uh, items two and three. Uh, therefore, adoption of an undergrounding district um, is our only choice. So although the city hasn't participated or hasn't established in any undergrounding district in a while, because it's because the city has been practicing, you know, the practice is to accumulate the uh, Rule 28 funds until an impactful, impactful uh, project can be implemented. So, and current, so this is the, the option that we, um, we should consider, uh, which is to form the uh, underground district. So the city has completed undergrounding of overhead utilities in the past. Uh, this map shows uh, the locations and years of when the projects were completed. So as noted on the, um, the slide, the oldest project was back in 1962 along El Camino between San Bruno Avenue and Santa Helena Avenue. And the latest project um, the city completed was in 1997 along Huntington Avenue between Forest Lane and Angus Avenue. So the other two main corridors that were undergrounded include uh, the entire length of Sneath Lane um, from Skyline to Huntington Avenue and San Bruno Avenue from Skyline to 7th and San Bruno Avenue. So to form an undergrounded district, uh, staff contacted the pg &E representative to obtain additional information. Uh, pg &E rep mentioned that agencies must select an undergrounding district location in the general public interest that satisfy one or more of these uh, reasons that you see on the slide. The first, the undergrounding will avoid or eliminate uh, heavy con concentration of overhead um, electrical facilities. Second, the street or roadway is uh, extensively used by the general public and carries heavy volume of pedestrian or uh, vehicle traffic. 
and third, the street or roadway passes through a civic area, a public recreation area, or an un area of unusual scenic interest to the public. Fourth, the street or roadway is considered an arterial or a major uh, collector. So based on our discussion with pg and &E Rep, uh, there are several locations that the city can select to form an underground district. And these locations have been vetted uh, by pg and &E and will qualify to, to be for the uh, Rule 28 monies uh, or credits to be used. So these um, locations are noted uh, in green and there's a table at the bottom left-hand corner that shows the, uh, the street locations as well as the linear footage of the undergrounding and an estimated cost. So the locations include you know, Huntington Avenue from Angus to San Felipe, uh, Mastic Avenue from Angus to Taylor, uh, Taylor Avenue from El Camino to Mastic, um, Angus Avenue from El Camino to Huntington Avenue, um, San Felipe from El Camino to Huntington, uh, Masson from San Bruno Avenue to Angus, and then Crystal Springs Road from Cunningham to El Camino, and Genevan Avenue from Cunningham Way to Poplar. So the current status of Rule 28 work credit is shown on the slide. Um, as of November 2019, uh, the city has more than six million work credits. Uh, each work credit is equivalent to uh, $1. So within the box, there is a calculation that includes a reallocation of about $29,000 to the city of Live Oak. If the city chooses not to uh, form an underground district, the city will still have a balance of approximately $6 million. So uh, what are our options? Well, first, the city can choose to not form an underground district. Um, as previously mentioned, there will be a transfer of, of about $29,000 uh, from a work credit to the city of Live Oak. Second, establish an underground district. Uh, this will secure or avoid the transfer of the work credits. And lastly, the city can choose to trade or sell the work credits to other interested communities. Uh, so based on our discussion with pg and &E representatives, the city could expect to receive only about 50% uh, on the dollar for these, uh, these funds. So with $6 million work credit that we have, we can get the cash for about $3 million uh, for, you know, if we do sell our um, work credits. So based on all the, uh, you know, the, um, the different you know, streets uh, locations shown in the previous slide, staff is currently recommending to establish an, an underground district along uh, Crystal Springs Road between Cunningham Way and, and El Camino. And the reason for this corridor is that the Crystal Springs Road meets all of the criteria listed in the pg and requirements. The road has heavy con concentration, concentration of overhead electrical facilities. Uh, carries a heavy volume of pedestrian and vehicle traffic. The road also, you know, joins the public recreation area, which is City Park, and is also a part of the scenic corridor. And the road is also considered an arterial uh, street. So the total length is approximately 3,700 feet, and then total cost to underground the entire length, ECR to um, El Camino to Hunt Cunningham Way, is about $7.4 million. And this cost is based on the most recent undergrounding projects, which is which range between a thousand to uh, two thousand dollars per foot. So, with an estimated cost of seven point four million dollars, the city would have a shortfall of about one you know, point three million dollars if the entire length is undergrounded. So, therefore, reducing the length uh, from uh, Donner to ECR El Camino is recommended. So this slide shows the boundary limits of the undergrounding project along Crystal Springs Road uh, from Donner to El Camino. Uh, the properties within the, um, the red areas uh, shown will be affected if the undergrounding project is implemented. The overhead service lines uh, to those properties will need to be undergrounded as well. So here, here are the next steps. Um, you know, first, we need to hold a public hearing on February 25th to establish an undergrounding district. The staff will also public uh, publish a notice of public hearing in advance of the con council meeting. And staff will send letters to those properties that are affected within that you know, red uh, area uh, and so request them to attend the uh, council meeting if they haven't choose uh, to speak on uh, any concerns about that um, of the project. So this concludes my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions from council? Laura? Uh Jimmy, clarifying question on, on the funding. So it's been since 1997 since we've done the last project, but you can see now that it, how much, I mean, over years, I'm sure that allocation of, of points is continuing to increase a little bit. 
So it's many years to build up this six million dollars, six million in points. So it makes sense why we haven't done something in a number of years. Um, and to understand that there's this new law that basically says if we don't use it, if we don't participate in the program, we would lose funding. But what's the requirement? What's considered? So we go to we go to use this money toward this project, and then we let it sit for the next 20 years. When are we in jeopardy again of losing those funds? Yeah, that's something that hasn't been um, determined. Um, so I think w w right now, um, you know, this resolution that has passed is for this immediate um, um, work credits that the, um, the requirements mm -hmm. are there. I'm assuming that um, the, the same requirements may apply in future, um, um, you know, instances as well. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, it, it may it may be that you get to a certain amount of points Correct. and then you start to lose some. They take some off. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, Javon Grogan, city manager. Um, the prior um, arrangement had been you could just let your credits accumulate and you would not lose any credits. I think increasingly the state, the balance of available credits citywide, uh, I'm sorry, statewide, statewide has had uh, the CPUC look at it and say, well, if we just some other cities have projects, they don't have enough money, and these other cities are sitting on large sums of money, and they don't have a project, nor do they have a district. If we just pull a little bit from everyone, we could fund these other areas that, that want to use a project, that, that want to do a project. Um, and one of the concerns we have is that uh, more orders like this may come down um, later on to increasingly decrease money from cities that do mm -hmm. not have a district. And so essentially, if we create a district now, we protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I, I want to uh, elaborate on is the district boundaries is from El Camino Real all the way up to Cunningham. Uh, to Cunningham. Gotcha. Uh, the potential project with the six million that we have now would go from El Camino Real to Donner. Donner. However, uh, what Jimmy also noted is that there is the ability for the city to borrow against five years of future credit. Mm. And so you could establish the full district. Um, there's currently a $1.3 million gap. If you borrow five years, that is 750000 That drops your gap down to 550000 to do the entire length. Now, that sort of takes it to be not an insurmountable sum that if the city council did want to divert funds from a, another capital project or wait till we had... Um, other funds uh, available to sort of make a full project. So I just want to let the council know that uh, while the full project is estimated to be um, just over $7 million and we only have $6 million, it's not necessarily an insurmountable task. And so establishing the district and then looking at various options to fund it could be something that happens in the future. Well, I think you've made a good recommendation in terms of this, the area that you've chosen in San Bruno, because I think it's it's a well-utilized um, street. It's populated by people walking, and so I think it's excellent an excellent choice. So thank you. Thank you. Marty? Um, I agree. Um, is there a way to – I don't want to get it too complicated, but when we're working on the, the new uh, Recreation Aquatic Center, of that area that's behind on Crystal Spring Road, I mean, because those trees are really high and there's some wires there, um, to tr try to get everything done at the same, well, that, that's probably gonna make it too complicated. So mm -hmm. let's just go ahead. I'm, I'm in favor of this project. Um, and uh, I guess we'll talk about it at a CIP meeting because uh, I'll bore you guys right now. But I, I think it'd be nice to, to the trees there uh, from here to Crystal, I'm, I'm sorry, to the city park, they're overgrown and I, and I walked by there for a little bit today and, and saw that one of the trees by um, the church did fall down and, and was cut by staff, um, I'm assuming. And um, it'd be nice to kind of clarify that area and that seems like the right spot to do it. So I'm, I'm in support of this project, thank you. Thank you. Michael? Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. So are, are there specific requirements for creating a district and why wouldn't we create a district around each of the areas that have been identified as potential spots? Um, yeah, normally I think what we've seen is, you know, people specify a certain location, a specific location for the district. Um, that's something, you know, if, 
that's something that we would have to discuss with PG&E uh, on whether we can actually create a district for all the rec recommended um, streets that you've seen on the uh, one of the slides. But, um, but normally, what we what we research on um, online for, with other communities is just mainly one, a single corridor or, um, locations for underground districts. But, but there wouldn't there's not necessarily a requirement that there be funding available to do a project within the district. You just basically say here's one that meets these five criteria uh, or, correct. or one criteria. Of the exactly correct. Okay, and and looking at at Huntington. Um, so Huntington is one that falls within the the, uh, the dollar amount of, of what's available in our fund right now. Um, that that stretch is, I mean, it has a, a side of the street without any without any houses on it. It's uh, I, I know it's uh, I believe Caltrain, uh, Caltrain. property, but it's uh, pretty much just wooded, so it would kind of lend itself well to trenching and and putting stuff in. Um, why not consider that one? Well, I believe that um, we, we selected Crystal Springs Road because you know it has you know a lot more use uh, for public, and it's also right next to the city park. Um, a lot of the um, overhead utilities there. Are, um, there's a lot more trees in, at that location as well. So uh, you know, during you know heavy storms event, you, know, you, you could have trees uh, coming down and uh, hitting these power lines. So I think it met a lot of the criteria that PG&E had in their. Um, um, it, you know, it, it, as part of those reasons that I, I uh, mentioned earlier. And so we, that's the reason why we select the Crystal Springs Road. Okay. No, I agree. Yeah, I think yeah. it is a good location. I was just wondering. The other one seemed easier, and it was also within budget, so I was just wondering. Yeah. Thank you. Linda. So if, if approved, when would this project begin? We don't have a, we don't have a current timeline yet. Uh, on this, because you know, I think once it's approved, we would have to, uh, tr you know, assess the, um, you know, the schedule for this, right? So I think we have to go through a public hearing. There's a lot of design components that needs to be done. You know, it could take you know a couple of years before any construction activities, um, you know, uh, will take place, because there's a lot of coordination that needs to be done, not just in terms of with just PG&E utilities, but with other utilities that are also on the um, the pole right now with all the. Um, Communication utilities that are there, so making sure that you know they can, they'll be able to transfer their utilities below grade and be able to provide the same type of services to the uh, the residential properties. Okay, so when this um, project begins, will who who will pay for the repaving of the streets, and how will that be done? Yeah, it would be it would be at our city's cost um, to repave the uh, the roadways. Yeah. And can we align? Can we align those then to make sure that we're not doing the underground utilities and then repaving at a different time, so that everything's Correct. aligning together? Sure. Okay. Um, and then my other question oh, is: sure. Does that mean that the poles will come down that are all along that entire area? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Okay. If I can, I, I want to clarify: um, by taking the action that council has taken uh, today, uh, you are not approving a project. You're creating the, the district, district for. Uh, essentially monies to accumulate for the specific project. Um, uh, I do think that staff in the, in the normal CIP planning uh, will, will continue to bring this higher on, on the list and, and we can look into putting together a dedicated effort amount around making the project a reality uh, and then that just has to go into our normal CIP planning and, and priorities. Uh, but even if we had a dedicated effort today, I mean this is at least a, a, a two to three year effort. Uh, before ground is being uh, uh, broke on it. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that um, if should if this project was done and the city wanted to repave the street to have a nice smooth surface over everything, that would be on our cost. Uh, within the project budget does cover um, capping the, the, the trench and repaving over that. Uh, and so should it be possible to sort of time this project right before Crystal Springs is up for repaving, that can be done. I think the biggest challenge with that is we just repaved Crystal Springs. And so that means you wouldn't do this project for quite some time. Um, and so you, you know, I, I think that's a, a, I mean, I think it was just repaved last year. Yes, in slurry sealed. Slurry, slurry sealed slurry in, in sealed. 2019. Yeah. And so if that um, will last five or seven five, years, five or seven years, you know, you'd yeah. be looking at five beginning years. this project somewhere in the five to 10 year range from now. So then I was going to actually ask about Crystal Springs being repaved, um, just to make sure that we're aligning 
our efforts and our finances. Does that mean that Crystal Springs is, uh, I understand why that was selected, but is there another area that maybe we could create the district around that hasn't been repaved so that we can get not just the repaving done, but also the district, actually, the district plan actually moving sooner than five to 10 years from now? Yeah, so a lot of the, um, the streets will be repaved. I think Genevan has, has been repaved. Um, when we did the, the sewer replacement project, Huntington Avenue, uh, that location will also be repaved. We have, the city has you know, grants already in place for that. Um, those Taylor, Mastic, uh, in that area will be repaved as well as part of the avenues 1-1, uh, 1-2 project. Um, so the only location that I'm seeing that won't be, re well, I don't know whether we repave, I think we repave a portion, or we're going to repave a portion of Masson Avenue as well. Um, so the only thing that I'm, I'm thinking, well, even a Angus Avenue West, it's been repaved too from ECR. Um, um, to, to Huntington. So I think a lot of the locations will be repaved, um, the, 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 what we've selected, except for Crystal Springs Road. Um, we didn't do a full uh, repaving there. Uh, we just, we did a slurry seal after the sewer construction project. Um, but that's something that, you know, will be a good candidate. Just do the chair. Thank you. Oh, did you have any questions? I just want to say, I do remember um, the Huntington back in 1997, and I will tell you what a difference it made to that area. It, it really it really was beautiful after it was done. And so I think with the new community center coming, mm -hmm. I think we, we shouldn't really look at the short-sighted piece of the paving, even though we repaved it last year, because I think it's going to come up again in five years and we're going to need to repave it. I just, I really do think that the Crystal Springs Road is an ideal it is a central part of our city, which is used by so many of our community members, and to only continue to beautify that area is just a win-win. Any other questions or comments from council? Um, I show this is just provide direction to staff, and therefore staff is asking if we wish to go ahead and have a public hearing to establish the underground district. Um, is council in concurrence with giving staff that direction? Yes. All five are saying yes. Do you have what you need? Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're going to move on to no, uh, item eight. Uh, comments from council members. Marty, anything? Uh, yeah. Um, so this uh, this is a message to uh, people that uh, know veterans or, or that are veterans. That I, today I attended a free barbecue lunch at the VA clinic at, on Sneath Lane. I got a late uh, invite to that, so I wasn't able to put that on uh, social media, but it occurs every second Tuesday. It's a free barbecue um, provided by a bunch of veterans that just want to do something for veterans, and it's right at the VA, hosp uh, VA clinic, so uh, you can get two for one. You can get you know, your body checked out, and you can also also get a, a hot dog and a piece of cheesecake. So that's what they had out there today. So uh, just pass out the uh, information for the, those veterans out there, and it's for free. Laura. Thank you. Um, there's a comment that was made earlier tonight that kind of caught me off guard because I felt like if you, you really only knew what the city did and staff members did and the council members did, you wouldn't make that comment. And the comment was that that the city should think about or have the approach of not what we can't do, but what we can do. And I think that it's, um, it's an unfair comment because I think that the staff really has it, is dedicated to this city. And there's a lot that staff does, and there's a lot that our um, city manager does and brings forward. And in the last two years, um, I've been very proud to be a council member in, in terms of the work that we're doing. Um, you know, there was a booklet that we got handed uh, last year at some point with all the projects and things that were going on. And that's what we can do and we're doing and we're getting things done. Um, the council set out uh, our strategic objective in terms of projects we wanted to complete and the things we want to do and we're moving along with those and we're getting them done. And we're going to talk about that again this year. Um, so I think what I, what I feel is that we just need to do better about how we communicate those things that we do do out. Um, we're making great strides and we're making differences. And so I just want to thank staff for the hard work that you do do. Um, we appreciate it. I think for a lot of us who are on the council that know what you do, um, thank you for the dedication. And I see, just keep doing doing the great work. Linda? 
Yeah, I just wanted to ask um, if we're going to be receiving any update on developments with timelines, in particular the Aquatic Center and the Florida Park project. City Manager. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, we will be sending um, the City Council uh, the uh, next PowerPoint that we provide um, to um, the, we are set on March 4th to provide an update on the Aquatic and Rec Center to the Foundation Board. We will send that information uh, to the Council. Um, in your uh, City Council, um, Mayor and Council Office, you have uh, nearly a thousand pages uh, uh, of the draft EIR uh, that is out and staff is doing the page turn on that. Um, and are uh, a number of hours into uh, turning it and re reviewing every page on that. Uh, that is set uh, to go to the Planning Commission in April and then uh, to come uh, to the City Council in May uh, for uh, action. And we are on track to put out construction documents on the Aquatic and Rec Center. This year, uh, we are currently uh, in the process of drafting a, a draft agreement for temporary um, location for the Aquatic and Rec Center uh, with the hopes uh, uh, still tracking toward uh, breaking ground early 2021. Um, but we will absolutely provide council uh, with that um, uh, PowerPoint update. In Florida Park. Oh, and, and Florida Park uh, is scheduled to come to the city council. I believe we are aiming for the um, March 10th or uh, second meeting in March. Uh, what that is, is we need to do the final design drawings for uh, Florida Park. Uh, and we, uh, this week, we're just reviewing uh, a um, bid from the uh, MIG, the landscape architect, to do those final drawings. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get that contract before the City Council um, as soon as possible. But I, I believe we're aiming for one of the meetings in March, and I believe it's the first one. Okay, thank you. Michael. Since the uh, draft EIR for the uh, rec center came up, I just wanted to thank staff for getting that to us ahead of time. It is a huge document. I'm about halfway through it, but uh, I definitely appreciate not getting that uh, just before a meeting. So thank you for getting that to us. Okay, anything else, Council? A uh, couple things. So I wanted to say uh, the, re the, uh, the returns are in and the badge versus badge blood drive that was held today that concluded at 6 p.m., I got notice that the police department uh, squeaked out a victory. Uh, and what it was was the police department and fire department get their folks and family. And as one officer's father said, he had no choice but to come because his, uh, his, uh, his daughter told him to. But um, that was held at the fire station uh, this, this uh, afternoon. And so uh, thanks to a lot of folks that came in uh, from the community to help out uh, to donate blood for the Red Cross. But thank you to the fire and police. This is their second annual time that they have done this. How many, How many uh, points? I was going to ask. They didn't tell me that. <laughs> I was in closed <laughs> session, so I only got <laughs> limited information. Um, got to have something else. So, um, Eric, I guess congratulations. I know you're just the interim police chief, but already you, you have a victory. Yeah, I'm going to give him a bad time here. Okay. <laughs> Um, when we uh, do adjourn, we are going to go back into closed session for two items. One will be a uh, conference with labor negotiations pur pursuant to government code section 54957.6, and then also uh, to confer with legal counsel with anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9D2, and that was our four cases. Before we uh, adjourn this evening, I did, uh, most of you may be aware, some may not, but uh, the gentleman and owner um, of Artichoke Joe's, Dennis Samet, passed away uh, late last month. And um, those that have been around, you know, Dennis um, is well known as the third generation uh, owner and operator of Artichoke Joe's. Took it over back in about the 1980s, um, where he has taken that business and that has been in San Bruno for over 100 years. So it's something that many people uh, know and have uh, um, been talked about, ran into Dennis. Some of the things, uh, whitewater rafting, people wouldn't know, but he was very much into that. Uh, and he had other uh, hobbies and traits. Uh, he was 
quite a, a interesting gentleman because of the fact people didn't know that he was uh, an innovator. He uh, had patents on things that are still used today by the military. So he was one man that had a business, but also was forward thinking whether it comes about a major earthquake and how do we get folks in and out? How do we get transportation from here to the East Bay with all the congestion and traffic? He produced a video that is very impressive. So this is a man that really um, did a lot of forward thinking as far as that. Um, the other thing too that not everyone knows, some do, some don't, um, is in my mind, Dennis was also I admired because he's a man that didn't ask for a plaque didn't need to be acknowledged, didn't want a certificate. He just wanted to give and try to make a difference. He gave countywide to various causes, but specifically into San Bruno. And just some that I know of, you know, from Cap to Parkside to the lights you see at Diamond 3. That was from the Samet Foundation, from Dennis. 4-H, Junior Giants, the Library, Recreation, Project Read, Community Day, Concerts in the Park. And there are many other things. And like I said, uh, in finding out more and speaking to the family um, and, and hearing from Dennis, it is in, uh, over the last uh, few months, um, what he really gave to this community was without question. You could ask him for support, you could ask him to help contribute, um, and he stepped up. And it was not that he asked for anything in return, he just wanted to make sure that uh, things were left better um, and his big push uh, as of late had been for the youth of this community and the education and the schools because he wanted the young people to have other opportunities. I sat in a school board meeting where he wrote a, brought a check for $10,000 to purchase items. So um, it is sad that we've lost uh, this very, um, I think, uh, a, a man that I admire for all that he's given, but he also was, if you ever sat and talked to him, a straight shooter, honest, blunt, and to the point. And, uh, and if you weren't ready for an honest conversation, then you shouldn't sit down at the table with them. So I will miss that. So with that, um, we as the council and this community offer our condolences and support and love to his wife and his family. Um, and we wish them uh, the very best and we are here to support them um, as we can. So your thoughts and prayers would be appreciated. And with that, I would ask if we could adjourn in a moment of silence in honor of Dennis Samet. Thank you, and our, the, we will adjourn to the next regular city council meeting, which will be held right here on February 25th, 7 o'clock, at the San Bruno Senior Center. Have a good evening, and have a good week.